Hello and welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for this exciting and insightful webinar titled Seven Lessons from the $26 Billion Man. Today we're privileged to delve into the remarkable journey and business wisdom of one of Australia's most influential property tycoons, Harry Triggerbuff, affectionately known as the High Rise, uh, High Rise Harry of Australia. Our special guest today is none other than Tyron Hyde of Washington Brown. Tyron has had the unique opportunity to advise Harry Triggerbuff on all things depreciation for over two decades. His extensive experience and close professional relationship with Harry have provided him with unparalleled insights into the strategies and principles that have helped um, Harry propel himself to this towering success. Tyron is here to share the seven key lessons he's learned from working alongside Harry over those years. But before we kick things off, just a little housekeeping. We're planning to chat for about 45 minutes today and allow about 10 to 15 minutes for your questions. Um, obviously, throughout the webinar, feel free to add any questions you may have to the Q&A panel. And uh, without further ado, uh, let's introduce our special guest, Tyron Hyde. Tyron, how are you? I'm fantastic. And thank you, everyone, for being here. It's, uh, it's an honor. Thank you. That's all right. Um, we were just chatting off um, off camera time. We were uh, wondering how Harry might be spending that $300 he's going to get out of the uh, federal budget. Yeah, it's a bit weird, isn't it? That people even like Harry still get that $300. I think they, I know we're off topic here, but they certainly could have uh, means tested a little bit, I would have thought. I think it got put in the too hard basket um, <laughs> that, you know, someone over 200K still gets that $300. I'm sure that could have been better directed funds to lower lower cost affordable housing or something like that, but uh, that's what they did. That's it. Mm. Anyway, I think we could, uh, we could talk about that for hours and get nowhere. No. But um, all right, let's set the scene for today's webinar. So obviously we're talking about Harry Triggerbuff, somebody you worked with for um, over two decades. Um, yeah. Now, I looked this morning at, um, you know, having a bit of a think about Harry, how Harry got to where he is. And, you know, somebody who was born in China, his parents fled Russia back in the early mm. 1900s. Then he mm. moved to Australia uh, in the 19, uh, I think, 1940s. Uh, mm. And that was after his visas were um, uh, knocked back from Canada and the US. So he's arrived here in Australia in the 1940s. And now fast forward to 2024, and he's you know, one of the wealthiest people in Australia. Hey, so. He's done pretty well. Yeah. He's done yeah. pretty well. I'm going to talk about a bit of his story there. Um, but yes, yeah, should we get should we kick into it? Yeah, absolutely. Now you've got a bit of a presentation you're going to share with us. I do. So I'm going to talk. Well, I'll start with. I'll share my screen. So uh, yeah, my, where's my present? Okay, here we go. Share that one. Okay. Can you see my screen now, Tim? Yep. Again, thank you everyone for coming on your website at the moment. Yep. There we go. You're not seeing that one. The there we go. Now we've got you. That's better. Great. Awesome. So yes, thanks everyone for coming. So today I'm going to talk about seven lessons from Harry Trigoff, how I met him, what he's meant to me, and the, and basically the uh, the seven lessons that I've learned from him. The last lesson is the most interesting one, which is where he told me the secret to his success. So I hope you stick around for that one at least. Okay. So I gave this presentation recently in the in the Philippines to 400 business owners, um, and it was I got a standing ovation to be honest. And I thought, well, this is interesting because when um, Terry Wright asked me to give this talk, I thought, well, I should talk about Harry because people are interested in Harry not not a lot of people get to meet Harry and he kind of entrusted me from the age of 27 I'm 53 now I was 26 so I'm 53 now um and I have had a long association with him which has been pretty instrumental in the Washington Brown success but also taught me incredibly different things from um learning with Harry and the projects that he does and I try and transfer that knowledge of what I've learned from him to the average day investor and so I've tailored this talk not just to business owners, but to property investors. So when I go through the lessons, when I try and apply these lessons to us, I, I assume you're either a property investor or want to be a property investor, and how it can help you on your property investment journey. So I'm going to break this into three parts, this talk. First, I want to talk about a little bit about myself, because all good speech talk about a little bit about themselves. I want to talk about how I ran Washington Brown from a Bali school, uh, a jungle school in Bali. A little bit random, but there's a story arc, trust me. And then I'm going to talk about the seven lessons I've learned from Harry there, I'm at lunch with him there. So actually Washington Brown. So Washington Brown, I'm the CEO of a company called Washington Brown. We've been around for 45 years now, a bit of a dinosaur company. I know you're thinking, Ty, you look 25. How on earth can you own a company that's been around for 45 years? <laughs> but there is a story there. So Washington Brown, we, we're quantity space. We work out what things cost to build, but I specialised in the property depreciation angle of it. Most quantity space, they work for banks or builders and they just estimate construction costs. But there's a little niche within quantity surveying that saves property investors money. That's my specialisation. Here's me when I was 17 years old with my girlfriend at the time, Sandy. Um, we, went to our, our, um, we went to our high school formal there. And things escalated. 
we love getting married. There we are today with um my wife and uh, that's my daughter and and that's little Hudson the puppy. And we all know all the dog owners out there know um who the favourite is, don't we? Here's a hit. Here's a tip. <laughs> woof woof. Um, but when I when I was that young man, I, I I didn't know what I wanted to do. And someone suggested to me, why don't you do this thing called quantity surveying, which is a combination of construction cost and and uh, construction cost and sorry, a combination of construction costs, property tax law or c- construction costs and what's it I had the construction costs and um um I've had a mental blank Tim. It's a, <laughs> anyway, it's a degree that specializes in, in construction costs and property, right? Yep. Um and so I went down that path I, I and I thought this is great. This this suits me. Oh, sorry, co- combination of construction costs and maths. Those two things right. I love. And yep. so I enrolled in this course called Quantity Surveying Construction Economics at UTS. I did that for two years. And then I did what every young Aussie should do. I backpacked around the world for three years. And the number one thing I back I, I learned when I backpacked Tim was that I'd never wanted to work for minimum wage again. So I came back and I finished my degree. But by then I was like 24. And I thought to myself, I'm getting too old to get into the industry at 24. But you know, I look at a 24 year old now, I'm like, you're bait, you're a baby. So I went to uni one day, the final year of uni, and there was all these 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 uh, ads on the on the columns of uni that said, Cadet wanted Washington Brown. I thought, oh, that's fancy. That's fancy. I want to work for that company. So I went and stole all the job ads, right? And I was the only one that turned up for the job. So I got the job following up. But in my final year at uni, I wrote a thesis on the effects of property depreciation on, on, on construction, uh, how, how that helps investors. And then in 1997, the laws changed and the government said, the ATO said, if you don't know the construction cost of a property, you can get an estimate from a quantifier to, do, to work it out. I'm like, hey, that's what I just, that's what I wrote. No one was doing this at that point in time. So I left Washington Brown and I started my own company called Property Depreciation PTY Limited. And that started going really well. And then my business partner at the time, my ex boss, Tony Brown of Washington Brown fame, he said, why don't we come back and become partners in the business? And my business went really well. And then I ended up buying him out. And that's how I ended up with a dinosaur of a company called Washington Brown. Things were going swimmingly well. And then I went to a business blueprint conference, a conference, and this guy got on stage, Michael McQueen. He's a futurist, and he told the future. And he said to he said to the audience, he said, there's four things that can disrupt the business. Number one, technological change. Yeah. Netflix and Blockbuster. How, you know, Netflix just basically ate Blockbuster, the streaming services, right? That was the first thing that could disrupt the business. The second thing, whoops, the second thing was the market shifts, you know? These days to buy a hammer, we don't we can't we don't see a we don't go to a local hardware store. We've got to go to Bunnings with 50 aisles just to choose a hammer, don't we? The market shifted there. The third thing that can happen is demographics can change. You know, think COVID and we were. That didn't really help their model. Everyone just started working from home. Everyone just realized I don't need to travel an hour and a half a day to go to work. But the fourth thing that he said, which really affected me, was legislative change. The laws can change and could have disrupted your business. And that was like, I'm, I'm listening to this seminar, I'm like, that can happen to us. And it did happen to him. In, in, in 2017, the government said, you can no longer claim depreciation on plant and equipment items if it's a second-hand property. So to put that in perspective, if I buy a brand new property today, Tim, and I sell it and I can claim all the ovens and the dishwashers and I sell it to you, one day later, you can no longer claim the ovens and the dishwashers, even though the law says or the government says it will last 10 years. Now, no one knew this was going to happen. And all our all the industry was in a bit of a shock because that's a lot of part of our business. It didn't, they didn't change it for commercial or industrial, but just secondhand plus, uh, secondhand residential properties. Like, oh my God, what do we do? I don't know what's going to happen to the business. It might, we'll lose half our turnover. So I did the only natural thing you would do. I told all my staff, I'm going to live in Bali and run the business from a jungle school in Bali called the Green School, which is this place here. Uh, And I did this for two years. Now, this is not an ordinary school. These are the classrooms. There's no air con. There's no walls. There's dropped toilets. No air con. And, oops, why do I keep doing that? And there's no exams, which the kids love. They go going flip-flops. There's no homework. Hmm. This This is the communal area. From a building point of view, it is unbelievable that every day um, they do tours of the school just for the architectural point of view. Mm. Um, this is the playground. This is the it's, this is the, the the football field. It's like walking onto the set of Gilligan's Island. <laughs> kids, they kids get dirty. They they go they come to school on a thing called the bio bus, which is a local bus that the, a year twelve student project 
where it's run on used cooking oil. So the kids at, uh, at school go uh, out and collect all the used cooking oil from the restaurants and then run the bus that nice. goes to school in there. At the, end of the, at the end of the school, 300 kids come in and learn English, provided they bring in two kilos of plastic to the school, the, West, the, the Indian, local Indonesian kids in. So the Westerners leave, and then 300 kids from um, the local community come in and learn English, provided they bring in two kilos of plastic. There's cows in the prop, there's cows in the school, there's rabbits walking around. So whilst my daughter's making raincoats out of recycled plastic, I'm learning how to make a bamboo guitar, and my wife is learning how to farm rice with the local Indonesian community. Now, I'm not here to give you a travel diary, Tim, <laughs> but I could talk about Bali all my life. But there is a segue here. Whilst I'm at the greenest school on the planet, I said to my wife before we went, I said, look, there's one person that if he calls up, I'm going to have to come back because, and that's Harry Trigobot, right? <laughs> He's, Harry's not a Zoom kind of guy. He wouldn't understand <laughs> that I'm living and working literally at a, a bamboo school in the jungle because that that's but jungle school has a like a co-working space and i said to my wife i said look if harry rings me up i've got to come back so here i am at the greatest school on the planet flying back with all that carbon footprint to have lunch with harry right <laughs> <laughs> which isn't that environmentally friendly now for those of you who don't know harry he's been consistently ranked by the Finn Review as the richest person in, in Australia. I think Gina Reinhardt is number one now, but, you know, she's getting sued by her children, so we don't know how that's going to end up. That must be a very frosty Christmas lunch, let me tell you. <laughs> uh, to, put it, to, put, to put his wealth into perspective, okay, if you were to merge Suncorp Bank, which includes Amy, GIO, Suncorp Bank, Vero, and all those other brands there, Bingo, et cetera, with the AMP Bank, you still haven't reached his personal wealth. That combined on the coin to the ASX is $24 billion. He's worth 26. The last four years, Oxfam estimated that he made $1.5 million per hour, per hour. So when he invites me for a two-hour lunch, Tim, I'm scared for the next fortnight he's going to send me an invoice for his time. <laughs> Fair enough. He's a good storyteller. When I met Harry first, when I was 26, um, the meeting went for about half an hour. There was only one minute at the end where he said, can you help me? The other 29 minutes of that meeting was him telling a story of how he first came to Australia because his parents emigrated or, or fled um, Russia because of the anti-Semitism. He was born in China. When he first came to Australia, he told me how his first job was, was being a milkman, delivering milk in Chatswood. Um, he told me about how he nearly went broke in the 70s where he borrowed money to build to, when he was doing developments, he borrowed money from Citibank and uh, they called in the loans. And he said, well, what do you want? Half the half completed development sites and no bank wants half completed development sites. So he vowed to finish those jobs. He paid them out and he said to them, and, and he said to that at that point in time, he said, I'll never borrow another cent again. And he hasn't. He never borrows any money. You can Google it. He does every when you see 50 cranes in the sky of Meriden, all paid by cash. And I'm yeah, not pulling out of school here, it's all paid by cash. It's pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. Um so he's a, a fantastic storyteller. So let's get into the seven lessons, shall we, Tim? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Lesson number one. He's the ultimate one percent man. I don't know if any of you have read this book called Atomic Habits. It's a brilliant book. I highly recommend it. It talks about two things. The first thing it talks about is how to create habits and and also to keep them. I'll give you some examples here. It talks about if you were to delete Instagram and Facebook off your phone and just use them on your desktop, you'll get an hour or two a day back. It's true. I did it. You delete them. And funnily enough, Facebook, they just feed you up the good stuff at the top when, you, when you're not there all day rather than just scrolling with all you, we always see is ads. If you just use it on your desktop, you get to see the good stuff and you can walk away. Another atomic habit it teaches you is if you want to go training in the morning, leave your gym gear at the front door because you're more likely to go do it at the night before, leave it at the front door, go training in the morning because you're more likely to get up and train Rather than getting up, rather than getting up at, at five in the morning and trying to sneak around and not wake your partner up and getting your gear ready, you're more likely to train, and it works too. <laughs> the other thing it talks about is the one percenters, and that's this guy, Dave Brailsford. So it talks about how he was a British cycling coach, and what he did was he changed the little one percenters of that British cycling team that had a mag a compounding effect on the team's success. For instance, he used to, he got doctors in to teach the, the the cyclists how to wash their hands properly so they wouldn't get sick. He got a consultant in to teach them what neck pillows to use so they wouldn't get sore necks when they're cycling. And it ends up that they won six Tour de France under his tutelage. They hadn't won a Tour de France for 100 years. 
They ended up winning 18 gold medals at the Olympics under his tutelage. They hadn't won for ages. So those little one percenters can make a compounding effect. And I'm reading this book and go, my God, Harry is the ultimate one percent guy. Mm. So let me tell you a story. So Harry invites me to lunch. Now, this is World Tower in Sydney. It's, a, it's the largest residential tower in the Southern Hemisphere. And he kept the top third for himself, as you do, <laughs> but what <laughs> as service departments. And yeah. people might know that, but what they probably don't know, see where that little arrow is pointing up there? There's a whole level up there, a penthouse, which he kept just for himself. Now, this is no ordinary penthouse. He invites me up to lunch here. And here we are at this lunch. He invites me up to lunch. And the door opens. There's a butler there. And I'm walking around this penthouse. It's a whole floor. It's like only a whole floor of center point tower in the city, except it's square, so it doesn't spin, because <laughs> that would be weird. <laughs> he invites me up to lunch. I walk down. I go, and I'm walking around this penthouse. I'm like, this is a bit weird. There's something missing. You know what's missing? Bedrooms. There's no bedrooms. It is purely a kitchen. And, 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 and bathrooms and just purely used for entertaining and for lunch. I'm like, wow, okay. So I sit down to lunch and here I am at this lunch and you can see this paper printout here. It's called Claim It. That was the first book I wrote. There's a little staple there in the corner. <laughs> I sit down to lunch next to him. He says, come sit next to me. I said, Harry, I've written a book. He said, very good. That's how he talks to you. Very good. I said, Harry, it's all about property depreciation and, and tax and property investment. Very good. Oh, Harry, there's a chapter in there about you. He didn't say very good. <laughs> <laughs> it's called High Rise Harry. And I gave it, I said, look, Harry, I think it's only fair that you read this chapter before it goes to print. So I give him the chapter. <laughs> I give him the chapter and there was silence. There's always like, you know, an entourage of Harry, six entourage, and there's silence. You could have heard a pin drop. <laughs> He's reading it. Pages. He finished it. He looks up at me and goes, very good. And I, 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 I wipe the sweat <laughs> off my brain. brow. I wipe the sweat <laughs> off my brow. Anyway, I said, Harry, look, can you can you write something for the book, you know, so I can put it on the back, something. So he grabs a napkin and I give him a pen and he writes this. He said, I made up my mind to work with time when I saw him. I, I made up my mind to work with time when I saw him. I never went to another Chinese way and I never regret it. I've still got that napkin, which is yeah. pretty cool thing to write, right? Yeah, right. So it's on the back of the book. And the only reason why, why he wrote on a napkin, because he's never used a computer in his life, from what I've seen. <laughs> he doesn't need a computer. All he needs to know, because when he started developing, there was no computers, right? So all he needs to know if I buy a site for 150k, build it for 350, sell it for a million bucks per site, per, per lot, the site works. Why does he need a computer? He doesn't need a Macquarie Bank fundamental strategy algorithm. If you're not what taking on any, any debt and have to worry about repayments, there's a lot less well, work you right. have to do. Exactly. So here's come to 1%. So I, I finished the book and I sent it to him. And I get a call. Uh, so I sent him the first copy. Dear Harry, thank you. You made Washington Brown, you know, all, you know, I want to say you're my hero, but I was a bit sucky. So, <laughs> uh, so I sent the first copy off the, off the press. And uh, a week later, I get a call from his EA, executive assistant. Uh, hey, Mr. Triggerboff would like another six copies, please. I'm like, why? She's like, um, he wants his executive team to know exactly what you do. Okay. So I sent him the copy, the copies, and then the one percent has kicked in. For the next year, I got in, I got, summons i say summons not lightly because when harry calls you into his office you go so the next year i got summons into his office for a five minute talk tyron teach me something new about depreciation he kept doing this week after week so by week 38 i'm running out of tips and tricks right <laughs> <laughs> but he kept doing it i'm thinking if he's doing this for me this little niche part of his business if he's doing that for everyone he's engineers i know he does for all his finance team right that compounding effect of what he's learning, his thirst for knowledge is off the Richter, right? That's yeah. the one percenter. Now, what can we do as property investors? What, how can we change our one percenters in property investment? Well, uh, supposed to be one, one thing would be I'm guilty of this myself. You know, if you've got a depreciation schedule for Mosher Brown or something, check that when you're, if you're claiming something, that it's still there. You see, that one percent. If you if you've removed an oven, you should and it's if you've removed an oven, put a new oven in, you should be writing off that original oven, right? And that happens with all that. And they, I've I've been guilty of this myself, where I've taken things away from my from my properties, and they're still in there claiming it slowly. Once you remove it, write the balance off. That's a one percenter you can change. Another one percenter every year, put it in your calendar to check whether you can get a better interest rate, right? That is crazy. Um, how simple it can be just to say to, to a bank, you know, I've got this, I can get this from a quarry. Can you match it? Those yeah. are the little one percenters that you can do. Another one percenter 
would be to know if you're selling the property, has there been any planning changes around your area? Particularly in New South Wales now where you've got massive changes occurring with from station to station, close to tra transport hubs. You should be on top of that when you're negotiating with your agent what you could, could get expected to know or what the expected price should be. Again, a one percenter. And also when it comes to knowing um, or, or, or releasing, re, re signing a new tenant, know what the market is. Don't just rely on the agent. Know yourself what you can get, right? So you can negotiate better. Well, I know I think I should get more. I'd love it if you're out there and if you could put in some one percentage yourself, you think that you might be able to achieve or what we all can learn about your property investment journey. Is there anything that any of you guys can, guys and girls, can um, uh, make us all think one of the one percenters that we can all achieve as, as property investors? So I'm going to hope someone puts something in the chat there. Well, I can certainly think of a couple. I think um, yeah. you know, a, good, a good habit to get into is, um, you know, every time you you go and get your car serviced, it's a great opportunity to call your mortgage broker. So you can start to, you know, create habits like that. Insurance is another one. You know, your, yep. your interest rates don't renew every year. You know, it might change a couple of times a year in recent environment, but um, your insurance comes up for renewal every year. So go and test the market. See if you can get mm. something cheaper. It's, um, I agree. The one percent is really add up. That that compounding effect is uh, huge at the end of the year. Absolutely. Now, I'll give you one example. I'll hopefully, some of you are putting something in the chat. I've got a business, I've got some money in the Washington Brown entity name, and I've got a business savings account, right, which pays me like half a percent. It's called the business savings account. I've also, I also buy some shares in Washington Brown. You have what's called under Commonwealth Bank a CDI account, which has money yeah. within there, right? So it's linked to your bank account. Now, here's the most ridiculous thing. I rang up my business bank manager and I said, look, What's the best rate you can get me on that Commonwealth Bank savings account? She said, oh, no, we can't change it, half a percent. But on my Commonwealth Bank ComSec account linked to, to that trading account, I get 3.5%. So it's better for me to put my money in my Commonwealth Bank CDI account than I can get on and I on my business savings account. I said, why is that? Go, Different department. We can't do anything. Just not, It's crazy, right? It is absolutely crazy. That just shows you that the big corporations, it is why it's so fundamental to constantly review that because – you know, you, you, there are some when they when banks get too big, they just can't be nimble. You know. Yeah. All right, let's move on to number two. Kiss, keep it not not the band, but keep <laughs> it simple, stupid. Yeah. You know. Um, now, Harry, it would have been look. I don't know about you or uh, some of you out there, but for me, the amount of di different businesses I've started under Washington Brown. When I actually wrote this out, this 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 uh, talk, I actually got a headache. I've I've gone into sinking funds, due diligence reports, building insurance report. Uh, uh, I even created a competitor myself at one point. I then tried to take on realestate.com at one point, right? Just <laughs> all this focus, leaving it here. Not Harry, no. All he's ever done is build apartments. It would have been so much so easy for him with his construction teams, his sales sales team, to go into commercial or industrial property, right? No, he's just stuck to... He's knitting, stayed in his lane, and built apartments. And it's far easier to build a commercial tower with one tenant than dealing with 5,000 pesky owners per annum, right, with all their legal, legal, legalese teams, et cetera. No, he hasn't done that. It's far easier to build an industrial box than it is to deal with the regulations around building housing for people to live in, right? He's just stuck to his box. It's just stuck to it, stuck to his lane. And it's obviously worked well for him. The other thing he's kissed it or kept it simple, stupid, is his designs. He kept them square. You don't see many curved balconies with Meriton Apartments. You don't see many curved slabs or balconies because that costs money. Now, by keeping them up, right, you can stack the kitchens on top of each other so the services can run up straight through, which keeps the cost down. So what that enables him to do is to – what that enables him to do is to – reduce the price so you will get on average a high you'll get a, a greater square meter area than what the competitor is selling down the road right and we all know tim that size matters <laughs> <laughs> right? and that's what how he's done it not not yeah. just because he's kept the simple the design but also he, obviously he, he buys in bulk and he also is, gets the land at a, a premium price because he waits and, and and buys the right time which i'll go through later so what can we do as property investors how can we keep it simple stupid we can stick to one. If you're going to be a professional property investor, stick to one item. So become become the expert in the retail industry. Become the expert in industrial. Become expert in offices. They're very different beasts. But and you can't be the expert of all of them. But if you just stick to one niche area, what will happen is 
the agents in those particular areas will, will come to you. If, you. if all you do is buy industrial and there's, and there's hurt in the market, they'll come to you and say, they want to sell, right? They'll, you'll become known as the industrial guru, right? Um, so rather than having a whole suite of that, it might be better just to stay in your lane. I've certainly done that with Washington Brown now. We've canned all those other side businesses. We just stick to what I did. And funnily enough, what I wrote my thesis on. Isn't that funny that I just stick to what I'm, I'm an expert in? But I think that's not a bad strategy. If you, if you just become the expert in that, child cares, for instance, because they're very different yields. They're very different beasts, you know, dealing with a different tenant compared to Airbnb. But you can't be an expert in anything. Stick in your lane is my advice as a property investor. Systems. He's got great systems. If you're 91 years old and you're buying and you're building 5,000 units a year, you have to have good systems, right? Um, and I saw these systems up close and personal June last year. There was a thing called temporary full expensing, which I'll try and make this simple. But as a when you if you were to build a hotel and you've got it, you've spent three million dollars on the lifts in that hotel. What you have to do is when you finish that hotel, you wait to the end and then you claim that lift system over a thirty year period, a hundred thousand dollars per annum, right? So what the government did because of COVID, they had this thing called temporary full expensing. They said if you spent half the money on, on that lift at, at July, at the end of June 30 last year, you can claim $1.5 million as an immediate tax deduction and then the $1.5 million you spread out. I hope you're following that. So that's not pretty relevant for you or me, but for someone who's building, got $5 billion under construction and keeps half his stock, whether it be hotels, whatever, it's a big ticket item. It's, it's worth ticket. knowing what you spent, right? So he engaged me to go out to his sites and work out what the stage of construction of all those, of, of all those buildings are. Now, this is no easy task. Here's one site he owns. It's got 44 blocks, not apartments, 44 blocks. And what happens is when you build a development like this, this is in Pagewood in Sydney. When you build a development like this, you don't just build them all at one time. You stage the development. You might have block A being at 10%, block B being at 20%, et cetera, et cetera. So I go out there on this site, and this is what, you know, they're all at different stages of construction. And this is, this is very unusual. It's a one-off kind of test for us because it's a COVID recovery. It's never had to be done this before, especially no one never of the size of American developments all over Australia. So I go out there to the former, I go, hmm, I've got my little notepad. I go, okay, block A. Um, how many ovens is there? He's gone 192 out of 158. I don't know, 192 out of 258. I'm like, okay. Block C, 52 out of 208. Block D, 13 out of 205. And I'm like, that's impressive. And I kept doing that through all the trades. And he knew every item. Mm. I kept going. And then I kept going to his other sites, Canberra, Melbourne. And they all knew exactly what percentage of every item in the in development is. I'm like, why is, why is this happening? So every week, they have to report to him exactly where every stage of construction, every building is. And they, and they all get collated. He doesn't do it. They all get collated. So he knows exactly where every building is exactly every week. The reason he knows that. Is because the the pace of construction is a key determination of whether there's a problem on the site. So he knows if Block C has 198 apartments built today, next week it should be at 215. Otherwise, there's something wrong on that job, right? And he's built that many apartments. He knows exactly what it is. See, for most people, it's cash flow is an issue. There's never a cash flow issue with Harry. So speed for so him to keep his thing on the pulse. He knows exactly. Um, he knows exactly where, where, if the speed is, is slowing down, there's a problem. That's him. It's, it's, um, it's a key trait for any business owner or anybody who's in sales to to know your numbers. Absolutely. Know your numbers. And that's that's actually how I bring this back to, to us as property investors. Hmm. So what if we should have a system. If you're a property investor, you could have a system where, oops, where I would say have a set plan of how investing, right? So I've mentioned hotspotting here. What I would start with, I just made. I, I just you know, put this slide together this week. What I would start with, I'd, I'd have something like, okay, before I found a buyer's agent, I would start with a parent on what property clock, which I'll show people after later. I'd get the hotspotting reports and I would overlay them. And there'd be someone else like Matsuik or uh, even um, or SQM. And I'd overlay these four independent experts and see if all four of them or three of them are saying, go and buy in Toowoomba, wherever it is, that's where I'd start, right? So I'd start with something saying, where all these independent, rather than finding a buyer's agent, say buy me a place. I'd start. I'd start with the opposite. I'd start and say, let me see where everyone, all these experts that are independent, are saying for me to buy, and start there. Then find a buyer's agent or something like that, or if I do it myself. 
So overlay, have a heat map of where the independent experts are advising. That would be a good start for me. I'd then have a strat. So then I would say, okay, I need a place if it's in a major CBD like Sydney, five kilometres from the CBD, as an example. I want a minimum yield. I want a 10 minute walk to the station. And just these are the tick boxes, the systems that I would have in place to buy a property. And I'm sure you guys kind of advise that. So it takes away the noise of the property as well. It doesn't, doesn't it becomes the, you, you, a mathematical rather than purely based on emotion. And that's how I would take, if I was starting my investment journey, looking back at my 30 year investment journey, I would start along that line. I'd have a system along this kind of line. I'd have probably eight, I'd have more than that. I'd have, you know, days on market, some other factors that I would include before I even started looking for a property. Yeah. So that's my advice or I'm not giving financial advice here, but I would, um, looking back on my journey, I think that wouldn't be a bad idea to, um, to you know, minimum yield, stuff like that. So that's my advice of how you can take a system from Harry to what you can do as a property investor. What you guys teach that kind of stuff, don't you, Tim? Yeah, we have a formula which sort of, um, well, obviously pr our price predictor index is a really good measure of where um, suburbs are at in the cycle. Um, yep. So typically for a, a suburb to, or an LGA to make it into one of our top five or top 10, we want to see a, a, a rising market. So we have formulas to um, identify where they're at. And then, um, yeah, we mix that with the empirical formula based on economy and lots of other things. Cool. So this is the Heron Todd White report that I was talking about. So they, they have a like a, a property clock where it, it tells you, you know, where's the rising market, bottom of the market, peak of the market, et cetera. So it's a, I find it kind of interesting. They do it for retail, commercial, industrial, et cetera. So I think a combination of those with 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 your reports, et cetera, would be a not a bad heat map to um to start with. Because I find a lot of people at the moment they they are experts in everywhere and they kind of might be putting people into places they might be getting it's just a, I think a lot of people get into a bit of an analysis paralysis uh, situation as well. Mm. It'd be too much noise. I agree. Yep. Cool. All right. Number four, I think I've learned from Harry is loyalty. There's a saying if you last a week with Harry, you'll last 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> I, thought, I read that in the in the Fin Review reason. I thought, oh, yeah, I can see that. But I've lasted 27 years. And and he has incredible, you can't build that many apartments without having loyal teams. You know, like he's, there's generations. So, He's some of the grandfathers that uh, some of the traders now, they're, they're grandkids of the people that started with Harry. They might have passed away because he's 91, but the grandkids are now part of his team, you know. So, being loyal, like for, I've experienced myself, where every I can tell you now, every competitor of mine has approached him and said, We can do the same, you know, same thing. You know what he does? He sends me their, he, he used to say, they've given up now, but he, he sent me their, their, um, their proposals. He said, What do you think? And I, oh, that's no good, Harry. Now, <laughs> when someone does that, do you reckon that gets loyalty from me? Yeah. Absolutely right, and I think building a loyal team as property investor uh, is is gold. Like I've used the same, whether it be the same buyer's agent, accountant, solicitor, particularly quantity surveyor. Um, and, but building that team, if you're going to become a pro expert, is is vital. Most of the developers that I've, I've worked with in all my life, they always use the same engineers, same architects, or a lot of a lot of the time they use the same team, so they know what the product they're building, um, and they can replicate it. You know, and I think. Becoming an expert or pro developer, or oh, sorry, probably investor, having that team that you build together, you can, you know, you can build a, a good, successful portfolio. Yeah, so I think, I think loyalty team. goes both ways as well. Customer loyalty and and also the other uh, direction with the buyer's agent supporting, you know, customers that are coming back to them. Yep, yep. So build a team would be my advice. Number five, follow the leader. Now I've made a fair bit of coin out of Harry, but you know what? I would have made more money, Tim, if I did a deal with him said here's my fees in this project let me buy you know let me let's do a trade and and have uh, a year or a partial unit in each one of your developments or more importantly followed where he went people like lang walker Tim gurner harry trigoff they're major developers if, if, if tim goes in melbourne if you have no lang walker just passed away sadly but these guys over my life i've seen when they go into areas they change the area if you follow them if i if every time Harry went into a different area and I bought a couple of townhouses around the corner from, from where, not necessarily in his site, but bought a couple of townhouses around the corner from him, I would have been far better off than probably with the fees because they change it. They know. They just have this knack. Mm. Now, what can we do as property best? Well, here's a, here's a tip. You know, you, you could follow where the next Bunnings being built. If you don't think that Bunnings or West Farmers has a team of demographers working out where they want to go, where that growth corridor is, you're mad. 
So if you can find out where the next Bunnings is being built, which you can do by companies called like Cordell's, you can follow them. And I would, um, that's a bit of a tip because they know where the, they don't just build a Bunnings randomly, right? They know where the growth is going. And and if once you know that's going there, it wouldn't be a bad idea to buy somewhere near the next Bunnings, if you ask me. Yeah. So there's a bit of a tip. Follow the leader. Don't follow the herd. I see a lot of people following the herd at the moment. Yeah, don't follow the uh, Follow the leader. I had a customer who owns uh, 500 karate dojos all around the world, and right. uh, every time he owns one, uh, every time he opens one, rather, he uh, he says it's never with uh, outside of a kilometer of a McDonald's. And I thought, right. well, what's, the the one. what's McDonald's. the relevance there? You know, it's not not because they're eating too many burgers and then you go to karate to lose the weight. It's because that, exactly what you said. McDonald's spends that much money on research to identify yep. those population growth corridors that that's yep. where he knew he could get these um, his growth from. So you know, success leaves hints one hundred percent. I love that success lift. And I was going to actually have the McDonald's slide. So the same in actually in my book, I actually say the I actually use that example that follow the McDonald's. So I use Bunnings, but I think Bunnings and McDonald's they're pretty on par on that. They both would have teams advising that um, have demographers within there for sure. It's not a fluke where they go. All right, cash is king. Now I'll tell you a story. It's, I won't use the numbers, but there was a. A site, and when you see cash, you've all heard that statement, but when you see it in big real life money, it's like, wow. Um, once this is the GFC, Harry bought a site once five kilometers from the CBD of Sydney. And say this is a site, he bought this. This is a land that's my bad background of grass, but let's say that's dirt. <laughs> and he bought a site for say 20 million dollars. The next day, that little corn down there that ripped off, he sold that for guess how much, Jim. $20 million. Yeah. He sold, so he ended up with this block of land for the exact amount of money of, that he paid for, for nothing, right? So he ended up getting approval for 2,500 apartments on that site um, because he had cash. So the GSC comes along and there will always be a fund that's overgeared, needs a quick decision. And with Harry, they don't have to go to a Macquarie Bank subcommittee to get approval. He can write a check and he can take the up and the liquidator wants to get paid. Um, and it, 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 they know the check's not going to bounce. <laughs> so there's always going, as I said, there's always going to be a fund that will over, over gear, et cetera. So, but what can we learn from that? Well, we don't all have $20 million, Tim. No. But what we can do is have patience. You see, well, I've been guilty of that in my past life. Or if just thinking that I have to be fully invested. I think sometimes actually doing nothing could be the best investment you can do. Sit back and wait. There will be, because, because good times will follow bad times. And sometimes, just not having to feel or just having a, a, a portion of your money set aside for that rainy day or that or that black day where the markets might shift is not a bad strategy. And that's a good lead into the final tip that I'm going to give you. The secret. The secret here is, he said to me one day, he said, Tar, and this is how he talks, as I said before, he said, Tar, do you want to know the secret to my success? Now, Tim, I'm not going to say no. <laughs> I wouldn't have thought so. Yes, Harry. Tell me the secret to your success. Tar, listen to me. He said, when times are bad, I buy land. By the time I get development approved, times are good again. Mm. I'll say that again. When times are bad, I buy land. By the time I get development approval, with Harry, that can be three to five years, times are good again. But what that, that, that could be a metaphor for life, for business, but particularly for investing. Because what it means is ignore the noise. Back yourself. Good times will follow bad times will follow good times. You see, for someone like Harry, it's not a question of whether you time the market or whether you have time in the market. For Harry, you see, he keeps half his stock. So what he does, he does both. He times the market and then he has time in the market. Mm. And if you can do that, you found the holy grail, if you ask me. Yeah. And I think it's such a brilliant quote. So I'm like, that's so simple. Why can't I? But I just thought it's so brilliant. It's like, yeah. So I, I think that that is a fantastic, uh, like something that uh, Warren Buffett quotes. It. So I just thought that was a fantastic be, quote. Be, be greedy when uh, others are wary, yeah. and wary when others are greedy. Absolutely, absolutely. So that's the secret. So moving on. So I have started a podcast, which I'm inviting. Actually, I have a meeting next uh, next month to get Harry on. I don't know whether he, he hasn't done many podcasts in his life. He actually. Is, um, I don't think he's ever done a podcast, but we'll see how we go and ask him <laughs> these 10 questions. I always want everyone to watch a video about uh, – and Terry Wright is actually on the next um, podcast. So have a watch of this. We'll put a, we'll put a link to your podcast in the um, chat for you. Oh, right. well. That'd be good. Maybe yeah, we'll cool. 
So what I oh, th th this video I made about it is um kind of explains it. So hopefully it'll come along. We just haven't got your audio um, there, Tyron. We've got. Oh. I think uh, when you do your share screen, if you go, just stop share screen for a moment, and then oh. as you share again, oh, there's, there's an option at the bottom that says share sound. Oh. Yeah, mate, Steve. Not working. No, no audio. So when you, if oh. you do stop, stop sharing uh, on Zoom for a moment, and then share again but before you select the window there's a button that says share sound if you select that that should keep oh, us okay so share oh share sound okay ah oh, yeah okay sorry everyone that's all right that should and then if you just start your video again we should be it won't that. let me share this it says click this option you want others to hear it it doesn't seem to let me select that <laughs> no oh that's okay. I'll tell everyone what it's about. <laughs> no problem. Okay. So um, let me go back to. Oops. Uh, Sorry, people. Yeah, that's okay, all right. Okay. So basically, I saw my father. My father was the smartest man I've ever known. He had four degrees um, psychology. He was in the Air Force for 12 years. And then uh, he, he had a stroke. He was paralyzed fully on the left hand side. Um, so most of my life, I grew up, you know, putting his shoes on in the morning, tying his belt up. If you've ever, you know, try and tie up your shoelaces with one hand, it's a very, very hard thing to do. Anyway, because of the stroke, the um, the 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 uh, organisation that was working at the time, they retired him early. So he got a payout of two hundred fifty thousand dollars back in nineteen eighty seven. Um, and what he did was he invested it all in one company called a state mortgage. And then when interest rates, when they advertise themselves as safe as house, they're investing in property. They work kind of, but they're investing in mezzanine debt, right? So that mezzanine debt is when a developer borrows, say, 70% of a construction loan, there's that other 10 or 15% that the banks won't give them. They go to a third-party lender, and it's a lot higher interest rate. And that's all they're putting into. So they would say, they could then say, oh, we'll give you a 1% more than the bank would do, right? When interest rates went to 70%, that mezzanine debt fell over, and he lost pretty much all his savings. Uh, and seeing him lose that was pretty hard breaking. I always get emotional at this point in time. Um, uh, and he used to get the letters from the liquidator saying, you know, you're going to get eight cents in the dollar, et cetera. And, and the stroke didn't kill him. Seeing seeing after all your life working on that you've uh, and losing everything was pretty hard. And I think that killed him more than the bloody stroke, to be honest. Anyway, so I've done pretty well over my life and I want to leave something for my daughter to look back on in time. So I'm going around, I'm asking the smartest people I know, 10 questions. Um, they're not just in property, but the tech questions that I'm asking them are things like, if you could go back and see your 20 year old self, what would you tell your 20 year old self about investing? Yeah, what's been your best investment, worst? Well, the final question is something like, um, you know, how do you not lose money? Like my father. So the Warren, Warren Buffett quote, you know, um, and there's, so there's the same 10 questions that everyone, and there's, there's probably people, there's, there's some share people, entrepreneurs. Anyway, everyone's answered them from a different point of view. Now, one of the other questions is like, if your 20-year-old 20, 20 child came up to you and asked you, I've got $20,000, how would you invest it now? So it's it's for not just for professional investors, it's for everyone. So hopefully you can have a listen. Um, it's been pretty interesting. Yep. Move on. Uh, am I sharing my screen at the moment? Yep. Sorry. Yep. yep. Okay. So if you want to find that, it's on my Washington Brown website, just on a podcast. There's, um, there's renovation experts, share experts, as I said. Uh, I only do one a month, so I'm not going to bombard you. But if you do listen to it and leave a, a review, there's my email address. If you leave a review, I'll send you two copies of my book. That's all you have to do. Leave, Listen to a podcast, leave a review. I'll send you a, a free copy of my book, Keep Claiming It, which Harry's got there. And also I've, I wrote a chapter in a book called Secrets of Property Millionaires. Um, so it's not that hard. It's not so hard sell here. <laughs> it's just, uh, it's just, if you, I think you'll find it interesting. If you're on this podcast, you're obviously interested in investing, et cetera. The other thing I'm going to do after this is I'm going to send you an email with a link because obviously it's tax it's tax time at the moment. Uh, and if you do need a depreciation report, there'll be a link where you'll be able to click in and get a 10% discount for a depreciation schedule. So that's the hardest sell I can give. <laughs> so any questions? Don't look at this like this guy who's scared to ask a question. Please yeah. fire away. I've left my email up there. So if you do want to listen to a podcast, send me an email saying you listen to um, one and left a review. 
I'll, I'll send you, I'll ask for your ad, uh, um, physical address and I'll mail you those books. Amazing. If you've got any questions about Green School, Harry, or depreciation, please fire away. I'd there love to go. have a chat. Well, thank you very and much. Thank you. Some, uh, yeah, some interesting but enjoying story to go through as well. It's a little bit different to our usual topics. And um, mm. you know, obviously, you, you've made uh, something like depreciation quite fun. <laughs> so I've, um, I've been described as the least boring quantity surveyor. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> um, so we've got a question. I don't. It's an anonymous question, but one of the questions we've got is, um, you know, you mentioned follow the leaders, you know, mm. um, but how how to follow and who to follow, I think is the question. So where do you find the best source? I suppose that's probably in uh, a, a couple of different realms in you know investment circles and then also just in life. Yeah. Well, I guess I, the first thing was be, I mentioned two other, uh, two people there. One was um, Lang Walker, um, even though he's passed away recently. I know he's just got a massive site out at Appen in Western Sydney, like near Campbelltown region. Uh, so I, I personally was looking at that up the other day going, <laughs> What, like it's 12,000 houses approved. Even though he's passed away, they've obviously bought that side a long time. So they're making major infrastructure projects out there. Mm. The other one, as I said, is Tim Gurner in Melbourne. I find that he always, he, he's going to be the next Harry Triggerboff. He's, uh, unless he's actually quoted as being the next, Harry Triggerboff actually said, he's the next me, right? <laughs> so I think where Tim Gurner goes is interesting. Uh, but as I said, we also said, was Bunnings and, and McDonald's. Follow those leaders, right? You can find that information of where they're going to be by, using a company called Cordell's, which mm -hmm. is they track where all the construction sites or where the next buildings are going to be. So it's, it's you don't have to, I think it's like a monthly subscription, like 200 bucks or something, but you could you could just go in one month and just then get out, grab the information. You know, you, a lot of people use that every month because they want to contact, the, a lot of people use it for, you know, if you're, if you're selling carpet, they want to know the builder on this particular project and continually sell them. But you don't have to do that. You could just be a one-month subscriber, find out where they're being built, and then track that area yourself. So that's how I would follow the leader. Mm. Very good. Um, we've got a, yeah, somebody's asking about Cordell's, um, you know, whether they get in contact with them. They're pretty easy to find, just uh, uh, Google. Cordell's Google. Google. Yeah. It's actually part of RP Data. It's actually part of um, yeah, the, the right. RP Data bought them out. Yeah. Especially on the you know um, commercial side of things, they're very helpful. A uh, yep. couple of questions, uh, ironically, about depreciation, Tyrone. Hopefully, you can help us out here. So, um, you know, it's always been said that you can get a lot better depreciation on new builds. Um, is it possible to get uh, depreciation through established property too? Okay, so it's a very good question. Um, and so, just to re-explain that, in 2017, the laws changed dramatically for residential property. So, if your residential property is second hand now, if it's one day old you can't claim depreciation on the ovens, the dishwashers, et cetera. But if your property is built after 1987, you can still claim depreciation on the structure, the building. So it's still worthwhile. We've still got a business, but it's just not as lucrative, lucrative as it used to be for secondhand property. Yeah. The ironic thing is they didn't change that for commercial and industrial. So you can still buy a 100-year-old commercial uh, industrial factory and still claim that air conditioning, or well, maybe not the air conditioning, but the motor or something that was in there um, today. So... It's still worthwhile, but you still claim the depreciation of the structure of a secondhand property, provided it's built after 1987, so it's still worthwhile. But, yes, it's definitely higher if it's brand new, which I kind of found ironic when they did this because they're kind of promoting just to build new or to buy new, which sometimes there is that, you know, spruikerish end of the market sometimes that can, you know, utilise that, that tax law to say, hey, we've got the best properties, but in reality it might not be. Mm. Uh, there's another one which uh, it does tend to come up um, quite a bit. This question: Do you have to pay back depreciation claims when you sell your property? <laughs> Comes up every time I do a webinar. <laughs> and I was on stage once with a guy named Steve McKnight. Yeah. And you know, people might have heard of Steve McKnight. He wrote, you know, zero to hundred properties in seven years, whatever it was, three years. Um, and he grabbed the microphone at this point in time and said, "Let me answer that, Tyrant." He goes, "I've got a big secret tip for you all: how to avoid this." He said. Don't sell your property. Yeah, don't sell. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But the answer to that question is yes, you have to claim, but there's two parts of a depreciation report. If you're if you're claiming the, the plant equipment, the ovens and dishwashers, no, you don't have to pay that back because that's sold or assumed to be sold at the written down value. Uh, the building allowance, yes, you have to pay it back, but provided that you keep it for more than a year, you carve it because you get the benefit of the, the CGT discount, which they didn't amend in the budget. So it's definitely still worthwhile. And a dollar today is worth more than a dollar tomorrow. So if you've claimed five grand, five grand, five grand, five grand, five grand, 
that five grand that you claim now is worth more to you now than it will go than than is going to be back then. So it's definitely still worth worthwhile. Um, but yes, the other ways to just not sell your property. Hmm. That's true. But anyone who um, wants a cash flow now, right? That's the main benefit. But is that oh, absolutely. Is it, make it more affordable now. And that's the main Rather benefit. the money sitting in your account today or the ATOs? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And if you don't claim it, no one else can. Yeah. Um, I've got a question from Rebecca. I settled on a unit Rebecca. in March, March 20, uh, 2024, but haven't purchased a depreciation schedule yet. Can I claim depreciation from March or now? Yeah. Great question. And the answer is yes. So we backdate the reports to when you actually... Um, I'm glad there's a lot of depreciation questions. Because uh, <laughs> uh, when I did this talk on, in the in the Philippines, everyone... Uh, not one person came up to me at the end of the conference board and talked about property. They all talked about green school. Yeah. Uh, um, but the answer to your question, Rebecca, yes, you can. We, we, the report will start from when you settle, not from when we do the inspection or when we actually do the report. But it's always backdated to when you settled on the property. So you haven't missed out. And as I said, I'll be sending you an email with a link to get a discounted um, uh, price. For, as, as a thank you for attending this webinar. And, and Tyron, am I right and say um, I've bought depreciation schedules from you guys in the past, but I think uh, from memory on my established properties, you did a quote first. Is that right? Do you do a quote? Yeah, yeah. So we'll look at the property. So yeah, sometimes whether it's worthwhile we, as well. Yeah, absolutely. So we, we can't get your lease twice our fee. We don't charge you. There's no point. If we can't save you money, we don't charge you. And because of the law is changing or have changed, not every property needs an inspection. Like for instance, a Meriton property, if you buy a second hand Meriton property, We've got the cost. There's nothing, me going out to see that property that's one year old of American apartment isn't going to get you any more money. So we pass that saving on to you. So we analyze the property first rather than just saying, yes, every property is this price. We look at the property, go look at our database. Of, you know, we've done 300,000 reports, Tim. We go, yes, we've been to that building 50 times. We've got the plan, we've got this. So we can pass that saving on to you. Uh, that's our strategy. And it's worked really well because we're actually helping people and not charging where they, need an, where they don't need an inspection. Yeah, absolutely. But some properties obviously do. Like if you've bought a five-bedroom house in Hawke Blues, it's complex. Obviously, we're going to inspect it. But where it's a cookie cutter and it, it, we've got the costs and they're all the same, well, we're not going to overcharge you. Pretty straightforward. Mm. Um, and another question is, if you were to demolish a house and put a new build on, can you depreciate all of that? Good question. So the dem actually, demolition is one of – there's only three things that you can't claim in a construction cost. The first one is demolition because it's you're not you're not depreciating you're removing something you're not depreciating. Yeah. The second thing is the site cleaning. So when you level the site and you clear off all the vegetation, again you're removing stuff. The third thing is landscaping, soft landscaping, trees, grass. They don't depreciate; they grow. So mm -hmm. they're the only three things you can't claim in a depreciation schedule from Washington Brown. Everything else is depreciable: the bricks, concrete, windows, you, uh, tiling. Um, yeah, so we just we just need to separate it into different categories because some things last longer than other things. So, for instance, bricks last longer than ovens. So we just categorize that into different different areas and different rates. But pretty much, generally, ninety seven to ninety eight percent of a of, of a construction build cost is depreciable. Very good. Mm. Um, I think we've got time for for one last one. Um, right. Can you claim remaining depreciation at sale of property for Div Forty assets? Can you, no, you can't. You have to. You can't claim if you've got. Say you bought. I think what this this question entails. If you've bought, a, say in a property, you have bought an oven for a thousand dollars, and by the time you go to sell it, it's written down to five hundred dollars. Right? You can't claim that balance of the five hundred dollars. You mm -hmm. can't. That's that's that's, that's not. The, that's the next person. Yeah. Well, yeah. So that's actually what they've done. In, uh, I'm off topic now, but that's actually what they've done in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. They've changed the laws over there recently, and they've. They've said that between the purchaser and the buyer, you need to marry up the depreciation claims. So there's no, okay, I've written down that oven to 500 bucks. I want the new purchase starts a thousand. No, it doesn't work like that. You now have to marry them up at the time of of exchange, which makes sense. Mm. Very good. Well, uh, I think that'll uh, bring us up to a close. So I just wanted to say to everybody, thank you so much for attending today. Thanks to Tyron for coming along and sharing your story. I, uh, I had a really good laugh out of some of those stories there today. Some, some very <laughs> good you. lessons as well. So it's uh, been a really enjoyable chat. Um, for anybody who wants to reach out to Tyron, um, it's washingtonbrown.com.au and his email on screen there, Tyron at Washington Brown. Yeah.
Tech.com.au. Take advantage of um, the 10% discount that he's going to be sending through. And um, yeah, if there's anything else that we can help you with at Hotspotting, hotspotting.com.au. Look forward to having a chat with you again soon, Tyron. Thank you. Thank you, Tim, for inviting me. And thank you for so many people staying on. It's um, impressed. Yeah. Thank you all. Terrific turnout. All right. Great Thanks stuff. Thanks so much. Chat soon. All right. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.